Hi, it's Heather from Thicket Works, and today we begin the process of building the abandoned boudoir diorama and installing the beautiful stained glass windows that we created in an earlier video. Be sure to download the free SVG files along with some helpful diagrams from the blog post linked in the description. Once you've decided on the dimensions for your miniature room box, it's time to cut the panels. I'm using Fomular and this Japanese pull saw in order to get the cleanest cuts that I can since I don't have one of those fancy hot wire foam cutting tables yet. It takes a few passes, but you get a reasonably good result with this tool. I'll be using a variety of tools and doing some experimenting today. I'm pretty happy with how this particular blade has performed, but I also want to try out a mini version made by Olfa. These dividers and carpenter square are going to come in handy because I need to cut perpendicular holes through the Fomular panels and then create a chamfer cut around each one to create a kind of medieval window embrasure. We'll give this little hobby saw a try and see if it's going to help with this operation. I don't know. We'll find out. Now you may recall that the very first gothic window we created has this rusted finish. It will be installed on one of the end walls of the diorama and we won't be doing that today just with the two gilded stained glass windows. To situate them properly on the back wall, I'm finding the center of the panel, and since it's 22 inches long, that means 11 inches. Then, I want to mark out an area three and a half inches from that center point on either side. This will represent the inner edge of where each of these windows will be placed. And then I'm marking two and three quarters of an inch from the base of the panel to help determine where the bottom of each of these cutouts should be made. Now that these dimensions have been marked onto the Fomular board, I'm going to trace the outline of each of the windows. Okay, now, how are we going to cut these out? I do have this old styro cutter, which I know is pretty dependable, but I really want to give this Olfa hobby knife a try. So let's do a test. First, I'll load up this very narrow saw blade and see how that does. I'll prop this scrap of Fomular up off of the work surface so that I can plunge all the way through. And you know, I have to admit, this little hobby saw does not feel as though it's the right implement for this material. Now I'm sure it's an excellent little hobby saw and I will have many uses for it, but I'm not liking either the accuracy or the way it feels during the cut operation. So let's try this wider blade saw. I'll just install that and it's very easy to do. And I'll begin by trying to create a very light cut at the surface and then work my way through the layers. And after quite a bit of sawing, we do get an aperture, but I'm not terribly happy with it. The edges are really ragged and not very accurate, although I can't blame that on the tool. So let's compare it to the results we get with this little electric styro cutter. To help me be a little more accurate than comes naturally, I'm going to line up the edge of the heated blade here using a one, two, three block. In theory, that will help me keep that blade perpendicular to the surface. We'll see how it works out. 
Now you need to be careful with this tool. It gets very hot and it can definitely give you a nasty burn. So make sure you have plenty of open space to rest it between cuts. Okay, now immediately I can tell. I prefer the results we get with this styro cutter, even though I see some user error. Yep, I'm sure this Olfa hobby knife will come in handy, but today I think I'm going to use this styro cutter. Yeah, those jagged edges are just a little too messy, even for me. Okay, now before we make the initial perpendicular cuts through the Fumular panel, it's important to mark out the exterior line that will help us create the resulting chamfer or angle. I'm using these dividers set at a distance of half an inch in order to roughly extend the outline of this arched frame. Now, I'm not the best in the world with using the dividers, but I love the fact that they help me be a little more accurate than I would be if I were attempting to do this by eye. Okay, so just to make myself a little more comfortable, I'm putting some holes in the corners of each of these apertures. And then I am very, very slowly allowing the heated blade to work its way through the foam. As you can see, I'm not terribly accurate with it. I'm trying my best, but my hands are just a little too shaky to get the perfect result I'd like to see. Nonetheless, it's close enough and we'll be able to clean up that shape using a variety of hand tools. And I think I'll hang on to this offcut. That'll come in handy too. Okay, on to the next aperture. Again, I'm moving very, very slowly, trying to hold the knife so that it just melts its way through and I'm not placing any undue stress on the heated blade. It's one of those things that you just sort of learn by feel. If you pull too hard, the blade will begin to bend. So the goal is to allow your hand to move slowly enough that the blade just melts its way through effortlessly. Now I'm just making some marks at strategic points around the aperture of each window. I know this sort of looks like masonry blocks, but that's not my intention. What I'm trying to do is give myself guides so that I can cut away that chamfered area with as much accuracy as I'm capable of. So here you see me trying to establish the correct angle by melting through to the outer surface from that inner line that we drew with the dividers. In theory, that should give us the correct angle. To clean the blade between cuts, I use a piece of sandpaper, but be careful when you try this because you can burn yourself. It's also a good idea to make sure, as always, that you have adequate ventilation. The fumes from this process are minimal, and I didn't find them bothersome at all, but you might be more sensitive, so take care of yourself. Now again, I wish I had a steadier hand, and yet I'm still relatively pleased with the fact that we're able to maintain sort of the same angle as we work our way around this aperture. It looks pretty rough, which is why I'm going to be working it with a variety of metal files to clean up the profile and then using sandpaper as well. This process does generate quite a bit of dust, so I recommend that you grab and use a dust mask while you are filing and sanding. A quick dry fit just to make sure we're on track before coating the entire inner panel with joint compound. 
Once I've got the panel covered with the compound, I add just a little bit of texture. I'll be knocking this back with a sanding process once it's dry. I cut quite a few copies of both the inner and the outer gothic window surround in order to give myself a lot of options here. These are the outer frames and these are the inner. And of course, these are the offcuts, and those are not getting thrown away. Now it's time for sanding, so definitely put on that dust mask and consider heading outside. If you wanted to, it would be possible to embed these window frames at about the halfway mark. However, I really want to take full advantage of that chamfered edge that we created, so I will be installing my windows on the outside of the panel. But before I can install anything, I have to actually construct them. I'm beginning by clipping together portions of the outer panels. And then I'm going to bond everything together using this high quality super glue. I work in sections adhering one portion, moving on to an adjacent area, removing clips and adding them as needed to make certain that I'm keeping the profile as accurate as I possibly can. For my outer window frames, I'm only using a depth of two layers. And once they are laminated together, I'm hardening the entire surface with an additional layer of this Starbond super glue. I repeat this process until I have four individual outer frames. Once they've been laminated and hardened, they are really tough, but they also feel a little bit rough. So at this stage, I like to pause and smooth the surface. You can do this with regular sandpaper or as you see me using here, an emery board. Again, lots of dust use that dust mask once you're happy with the smoothness we can move on to the next phase and that is creating the inner frames the inner window surround is sized to leave a tiny lip when it's applied to the outer one this will create a very sturdy framework for the delicate window and you'll use as many layers of this inner frame as is necessary to match the depth of your window. In my case, that was five layers. Your mileage may vary, so cut plenty of the frames. And when you're ready to laminate together a thick stack, align the edges very carefully and clip them in place. Then apply this super thin super glue to the interior edges and be amazed as capillary action actually draws the adhesive deep into the edges of the chipboard. Allow that to cure and then reverse the clips, place them on the inside of the frame and then apply super glue to the exterior edges. Now, if it drips down and adheres one or two of the clips to the surface of your frame, don't worry, just use a sturdy blade to help pry it off the surface. These little clips are amazing. I don't know how I ever lived without them. And then once all of your layers are laminated together, harden the exterior with an additional layer of super glue. When it's dry, Sand it until it feels smooth to the touch. And now you can fit your beautiful stained glass window inside of this inner frame. And then we'll be adding the exterior frames on either side, sandwiching the stained glass firmly in the center. It's going to be mega sturdy. I'll be using Fabri-Tac to glue all of these layers together, but another good quality adhesive like E6000 will also do the job. 
first I apply the inner frame stack to one of the outer frames and you can see the little ledge or reveal here. I allow that to set up for a few minutes and when it feels firm enough we can now install the stained glass window into this little housing area. And then apply adhesive to the other outer frame, align it carefully and press it into place. And to clamp this I'm turning to these little metal spring clamps because they are super strong. There, now I'll let that set up for an hour or so. While the adhesive is curing, I'm going to attack the inner wall of the abandoned boudoir with a variety of implements, metal files and needle files, and create a masonry texture. Then I'll coat the whole thing with heavy white gesso, allow that to dry, and begin to add a very basic background layer. As the diorama progresses, I hope to create a lot more interest on this beautiful wall. But for now, just putting down a soft background of brown acrylic craft paint diluted with very strong instant coffee gives a nice, soft, warm sandstone feel to the piece. And that's really all I want to achieve today. The focus is on the windows after all. So to get them installed, I flip the piece over, verify the outlines, apply Fabri-Tac, make sure everything's aligned correctly, and hold everything in place with a heavy weight until the adhesive sets. Even at this early stage, we now have a backdrop for some interesting miniature photography. I hope that this video has been of use to you, my friend. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Until next time, bye.